please welcome the President and Chief Executive Officer of Human Geo, Mr. Al DeLeonardo. Okay, great. Thank you, John. And please, let me, I'd like to bring the rest of the panel on out here with me. So, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, AGS. Thank you, John, and the team here uh, this week doing a great job. Having been here last year and seeing this go from one day to two days, I was a little bit nervous that uh, the presentations were going to get longer and longer and there wouldn't be any jokes. So I, I made sure that I tried to have a, a little light presentation for you guys today uh, as, as the uh, panel moderator, that is. So we have uh, C Colonel Pat Mahaney, uh, the Director of U.S. Army Strategic Studies Group, and Dr. Melinda Latore here today from Colorado State. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, them in just a few minutes, and, and I hope that you all have your questions ready for this panel. So I'm really excited to know that my, my Yogi Berra quote made it all the way to day two without anybody um, using it. So I had about four of them ready to pull up. So again, I'm Al DiLeonardo. I'm the CEO of Human Geo. Uh, we are an Arlington-based uh, technology company uh, focused on data analytics and geospatial uh, analytics as well. So uh, we have a a panel here today, and what I did is I have about just 10 slides, and I'll, I'll speed up here in just a minute. And, but I had to stop, and I made two slides yesterday based on all the great presentations that I saw around migration, immigration, smart cities, the vertical uh, farming, and, and many other ideas. And I thought, well, I'm a geospatial company. Even though I'm only a moderator, I better put some stuff in geo and put it up on the... Uh, on the net. So that's what we're going to do here for a second. So please, uh, if this doesn't queue up, please queue this video. Okay, so this, this is refugee migration based on the UN data right off the web um, from 1951 until today. And you could just watch it build. It's only about 30 seconds. I know we had a lot of talk on these topics yesterday, and I thought it would be neat to visualize it today. So you see the to and the from is basically how those arrows are working, where they start and where they drop. So there's been a lot of refugee movement that's been tracked, and, and I can't speak to the quality of the data, but, there, but what I will say, what you'll see in this, is that uh, when you get to 2014, you're talking about almost 15 million refugees moving in a given year, and the number is you know, dramatically increasing in the last three or four years. So the first panel, uh, the first couple panels today made me think, uh, on, on Thursday, I should put this together. So instead of going out drinking last night, this is, this is what I did. All right, well. Some truth, anyway. OK. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm going to go to the next. Uh, this one was about 2 AM when I did this one. So this is also UN data, and it's, uh, it's urbanization. It made me think of some of the urbanization panels that went on yesterday that would tee up for security for our panel today. So this is a, a city-focused uh, set of urbanization. Did it run through? No? OK. And, and the main thing it's, you should see popping out of this is it's not just China. It's, it's urbanization trends throughout Asia, especially. So not just China, but India, Indonesia, Japan are, are big, big hot spots that you're seeing. OK. And then finally, the last one, this was about 2.30. was this is more of a country look at urbanization to give you a feel for, I think, what many of the, uh, the, the panelists discussed yesterday in various forms. If you could just cue that one, please. OK. 
All right. Thank you. So I just, that, that is just, uh, can you forward to the next slide? And then we'll begin. Okay. All right. Thank you. So the, just sitting in the back yesterday uh, with all the great presentations, I said, well, I got to make some, some geo out of it. And so that, that's what we did literally yesterday, last couple of days. So look, we're here to talk about security and urbanization. Um, I thought I'd key up, key up about five more slides, six more slides, really quick, and, and, and talk about some of the things we, we know in general. And I think this one just tees it up. I think that the only thing that I, I can stand up here and say is that, that I really believe in for sure when you look out at 2050 is that the pace of te technology is gonna far out, out uh, exceed other paces. But there's some good news and bad news, and we'll talk a little bit about what the good news uh, is before we, before we move to the bad news. So infant mortality, when, you know, I was surprised to see, looking uh, on the web preparing for this, how, how much infant mortality is going down around the world and disease is going down around the world. The demographics here uh, squeeze both ends. There's babies, more and more babies being born, but less and less dying. Doesn't mean we don't have problems in that category, but the trends are, seem to be moving in the right direction in some cases. We have things like war, right? Whenever you see an asterisk, everybody gets, gets concerned. But war be, being here, being eradicated possibly? Well, maybe not. But, but what I'm trying to show is that you're going to continue to see less and less uh, violent conflict between countries and more and more uh, from non-state actors. I think a lot of people have been predicting that for more than a decade. I think we're finally seeing that uh, start to come to fruition, and we probably will see that um, more and more going forward. So this was a surprise personally to me because I don't focus on these kind of statistics, but this, this came from the World Bank. And it's, it's showing that over time, from 1981 to now, that poverty is going, uh, extreme poverty is going down. Now, I put a quote in there by Bill Gates. Of course, he, he and Melinda Gates are doing great things, but I thought for sure, if I could predict one thing that would absolutely be true by 2050, and that is that Bill Gates will not be poor in 2050. <laughs> All right. I got one joke. OK, so look, everything's great then, right? I'm painting this picture that you know, we've been hearing uh, stats for the last couple of days. I'm painting this picture that urban, older, healthier, wealthier, we're all doing great. But you know, you know that there's a downside to this that I'm coming to. And then, uh, you know, or is it is my, my, my question and my, uh, that I'm going to tee up to the panelists here in just a minute. We have a lot of challenges ahead. Many of them have been discussed, you know. One of them in particular that we haven't talked about, but we'll just mention. Uh, in an increasingly urbanized world, you know, we have uh, more and more uh, robots coming ahead. Internet of Things was talked about a lot last year. Right? Those things are going to continue to take place, replace people's jobs. As we move to an urbanized world and, and more larger and larger cities and mega cities, will we have uh, challenges with jobs? And if we have challenges with jobs, you know, how will that, uh, how will that affect things? How will military responders, how will uh, fire first responders and things like that end up uh, working in 2050. Uh, I promise you our panelists are going to cover that. All right, so cyber war, we know that we know that's a high payoff target uh, in, in centralized cities. You know, the end of bombs and bullets going forward, uh, the beginning of tax on mass power, right? We're seeing that now. Uh, nothing should change in that regard. That's going to continue to be the non-state actor threat for quite some time. Hygiene, sanitation, and public health concerns will, will be power, par paramount as we go forward, as we get larger and larger uh, populations, uh, as cities grow faster and faster. You know, one thing that's been talked about a lot, uh, a lot the last 20 years so, uh, is, is resources. Uh, that's going to continue to be a problem. Uh, we see that, you know, going on worldwide right now. So I want you to know that I've got this model, right? Um, I worked hard on this. This was between 2 and 3 a.m. And the point here is that you've got a bunch of good things going on, right? But a lot of uh, things that are going to destabilize the world going forward, right? I think that's, uh, I'm just beating the drum that everybody's been hearing the last few days.
Okay. Now to the sort of main event, right? Uh, this is why we're here today. What we have on this uh, panel today is we have Colonel Patrick Mahoney, who's an Army Special Operations Officer, currently serving as the Director of the Chief of Staff of the Army Strategic Studies Group down in D.C. Uh, he's a recently a military fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations, and most notably, he recently also commanded uh, the, the U.S. Army's Asymmetric Warfare Group. For those of you not familiar with, with the Army in that regard, uh, he was responsible for global support to U.S. and allied forces and interagency for countering asymmetric threats for a number of years. We also have Dr. Melinda Latore, uh, who is a professor of geography in the Department of Ecosystem Science and Sustainability at Colorado State University. She's also the director of the, of the geospatial centroid at CSU. She also has extensive experience over the last 20 years uh, in international uh, mapping. And so you're going to see in her presentation some really good geospatial uh, uh, points she's about to make around security. So, so Pat will come up in just a minute, and he'll talk a little bit about his perspective and the changing way the military is going to have to face some of these functions. And Melinda's going to talk a little bit about some of the conditions and the data around geospatial that are going to destabilize some of these conditions going forward and the challenges that uh, both she sees and that, and that Pat has, will have to address for the future. So I'd like to turn it over to, to Pat uh, to come on up and uh, kick it off. I think so. Thanks. Thank you. First of all, thank you for having me here. And it's really tremendous to see the diversity that's in the audience. Uh, there's, we're dealing with very, very complex problem sets. Obviously, my interest in it is mainly from the security sector. But I'd like to state up front that the security sector is not simply military or policing. It's, it's very broad. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll talk through that a little bit. What I think we as a country, we as a civilization, frankly, need to expand our view of what security is. And it's not all about guys and girls with guns. It, it is not. There's a, there's a holistic approach that has to be here. And what we're seeing right now is a rise of some very, very complex situations that include co very complex threats. While interstate war is going down, as Al pointed out, uh, we're seeing a rise of violence. One of the uh, things I'll throw out before I run a, uh, a quick five-minute video uh, that I think is very germane to what we're talking about here, in terms of threats, uh, one of the things we're seeing is because of the democratization of technology, which is great, we all have smartphones, we all have tremendous connectivity, there's, there's just tremendous goodness for humanity that comes out of it. On the, on the, Downside, there's also a thing that we sometimes call the democratization of destruction. And I'm not trying to be Mr. Doom and Gloom here, but an individual has more power to inflict harm nowadays because of the rise of technology. Uh, and in some cases, they may be more motivated to do so for a variety of sociocultural reasons. But at the end of the day, we know we have more people. They're urbanizing, meaning they're moving into cities. And you've got something we really haven't seen before, where you've got the ability to um, wreak some havoc in the hands of small groups of people. So using that as a happy note as a kind of a backdrop here, coming out of a decade plus of war, one of the things we, we in the military need to look at is, okay, what's the future operating environment, as we say? So some of the obvious things for you may be, well, urbanization is going up, and, and so many things are going on. There's strains on resources. There's tremendous developments in technology. Well, Ro Roger got it. But for us, that means, yes, I understand, by the way, in, in military talk. In, for us, what does that mean? What are we going to do with that? What, what is the future environment that we're going to have to operate in? And one of the things that was truly striking for two reasons. One is it was so obvious. Second, because none, nobody on our side was really working on it, to be honest with you, is the rise of dense urbanization. So an effort called megacities which is defined as 10 million or more, fine. But the real intent behind it is not per se megacities, although that too. It's really about densely urbanized areas. We start to see complexity in ways that we just haven't seen before. In, in, if you apply our doctrine, our ways of doing business, whether it's for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief or for combat operations, and for us, both are, are quite significant. In fact, we're more likely to be in humanitarian assistance and disaster relief than we are in actual combat operations. But do our current approaches work in those types of environments? So we have to model them. We have to look at them. What we're finding is not as nearly as well as we like to think. 
Well, that, there was an issue that was brought up often to us saying, well, why would you ever want to get involved in these dense urban areas, perhaps megacities? The answer is because we might have to. We, we don't get to choose where we go. So in a way, it was an ostrich technique of hiding your head in the sand of saying, this is too hard. We don't want to have to deal with this. So uh, one of the things that a unit and a group I was charged, uh, put in charge of, we had to do was to get people's attention. We realized that PowerPoint slides for this type of um, communicating the type of uh, urgency and the, and the complexity, the enormity of the task, we're just not going to do it. Simply explaining things to people weren't going to do it. So we had to help people visualize. So we created a five-minute video, which I'm going to show you right now. The video contains a caveat. It contains class, uh, excuse me, it's certainly not classified. It contains, <laughs> hello, it contains uh, copyrighted material, which under the fair use uh, amendment, I'm not a lawyer, excuse me, clause, we can use, but we cannot distribute it. We don't take credit for it with our slides on it. But the point was, it was not going to be a usual US government or US military hoorah sort of video to, to get people going. It, it wasn't that. We had to get people's attention in about five minutes, senior decision makers, to make aspects of this comprehensible. It's not perfect, but having said that, this is, uh, I'll show you the video and then I'll take it from there. Could you queue up the video, please? Okay, again, that was done as a think piece geared towards a specifically US Army uh, audience, including National Guard, Army Reserve. And it was trying to serve as a wake-up call, a think piece. It does, there are points within there that you can argue with, that, that's fine. That was part of the, the idea, was to get people talking about this, this milieu. And so uh, it's been fairly successful, certainly uh, in getting people's attention. Uh, and, and that's very important because you have to ask yourself, well, if it's that difficult, um, how are you gonna do this? Well, we have a, a saying in the, uh, the military, to, to deal with a problem, first you have to understand it, you have to be able to uh, uh, visualize it, get an idea of it in your head. You have to be able to describe it, and then you have to be able to direct, if you're a senior person, go through this. So let's start with that first part, understand. Well, this is so complex, and although there is expertise within the Department of Defense, within the US government, within the US Army, uh, for some of this, it's very niche. And what we're saying here is that that type of niche expertise, whether it's at the Department of uh, uh, geography and environmental engineering at West Point. It's in one of the various uh, agencies of the intelligence community or, or wherever. Um, that has to be migrated out away from the classified side or the truly esoteric side, and that elements of it at least have to be migrated into the hands of particularly soldiers and Marines who are going to have to face this sort of thing. So what does that mean? Well, first there's a, uh, clearly an education piece that has to occur. There's a training piece that has to occur. We have to develop the concepts to deal with this, and it's not charged straight into something like that. A quick uh, no, sense of scale here. The, the active duty United States Army is 490,000 people right now. With the National Guard and the Reserves, we're right at 980,000 people. You, could, you can't deploy everybody at one time. The, theoretically, the max would be one third. That's crazy. You wouldn't even come close to that. So you can deploy maybe, maybe 200,000 troops. You got one shot at 200,000 troops. You drop them in an environment like that, they wouldn't even know you're there. So, so you can't have simple uh, approaches to this. You have to start to understand complexity itself, the interrelated uh, nature of things, political, uh, military, economic, social, infrastructure pieces, um, information, physical space, geography, right? Uh, time. You have to be able to understand how all this comes together. We deliberately use the word flow in there to introduce the concept of flow. So you disrupt the flow in a large city, you've, you've created second and third order effects you don't want to have to deal with. You may be making, we probably are, making everything worse. So it changes the way you have to look at that. And uh, finally, there's a material development piece on that likewise. So how do you get after this? Well, first of all, we found it incredibly, extraordinarily um, helpful to create what we call a community of interest and then a community of practice on this. Uh, in fact, some of the members of our community of interest slash practice are here right now. Well, you start with the interagency, obviously, the military, but the military is not monolithic. <laughs> it's very famous, like any other bureaucracy. There's people that should be talking to each other that don't, um, and, and you, you lose a lot of goodness that's in there. So you have to bring those people together. But then outside of the military, clearly in academia, there's a tremendous amount that we can learn and work together on. But then there's also an interesting piece here. When you talk about, we, we say interagency, um, normally it means military, intelligence agencies, uh, uh, Department of State, uh, FBI. It's a federal level thing. Well, is this really a federal level problem set? Is there any real expertise, practical expertise? 
at the, in the federal government? He, probably yes, but it's very limited. So where does that expertise reside? Obviously down at the municipal level of our larger cities, here in the United States and elsewhere. So we'd be very foolish indeed if we didn't wrap in those who deal with dense urban areas and, and megacities and figure out what we could work together on. And we have, in fact, uh, done that. Uh, New York City Fire Department in particular has been incredibly helpful for us. Because, and again, I have to emphasize that we're not just talking about combat operations. We're talking about the ability to just do anything. And, and I'll cover a couple of specific points on that in just a second. Um, education. On the education front, West Point uh, has really been tremendously helpful on that. I understand there was a panel yesterday. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend yesterday. Uh, and they, they've kind of got the point on that reaching out uh, to others. Now, when we talk about training for the types of things that, that I have to deal with, I want you to take the word, two words actually, security and safety. Just think about them in the English language and what they mean. Security and safety mean in English, two different things. Security is people with guns. Safety is essentially firefighters, crossing guards for that matter. But there's a, there's a line that's drawn there. In the case of the types of problem sets that we're going to have to deal with, you shouldn't draw those lines. In fact, in many languages, many cultures, it's the same word. Spanish, seguridad, means safety and security. Securité in French, securita, Italian, etc. You, you have a more holistic concept right from the use of the word. And sometimes you'll find that words have meanings. And people actually divide out. So why would the Army be talking to firefighters, for example, EMS personnel? Well, actually, because we might be dealing with some, uh, some very similar areas. Let me be specific, and then I'll start to wrap this up um, with kind of a concept that I think is, is, is relevant out there. Cities include such things as subterranean, as mentioned, the subterranean labyrinths. We in the US military have very, very limited capability of operating subterranean. And there's many pieces that would go in uh, with that, but we started working on that in the last three years. But we're not the experts on it, so we have to find those who are and work with it. We find, for example, firefighters are. Cities, buildings go up. How good are we at operating it in skyscrapers or that sort of thing? Again, even for humanitarian resistance, there's the humanitarian relief efforts. There's a concept of vertical threat environment. If you want to get a sense of that, look at what happened in Mumbai 2008 how tall buildings were used, and imagine what, could, what uh, other people could do with that. The very usage of fire and smoke as a weapon. Okay? We were working on this actually prior to the Benghazi attacks because the threat was starting to understand that this is something ubiquitous, inexpensive, easily employed, and incredibly dangerous. And you start to realize, well, tell a soldier, you're in smoke, what do you do? We put on our uh, gas masks, which are meant for chemical warfare. Yeah, but they don't filter out carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide, and other gases that exist in normal smoke. So we deluded ourselves to think we could even survive in that area. Um, how do you track personnel, especially as they go up, the Z axis, as it's called? Do we have the technology? How would you control this sort of environment? We talk a lot about weapons of mass destruction, a term now weapons of mass effect, which, which is certainly very concerning. Why couldn't people, bad people, use hazmat, hazardous materials? in that type of a role. How would you even deal with that, in, especially at scale? Well, we have to talk to those who know it. Um, and I haven't even touched right here in this, these very complex problem sets at the tactical level with the other factors that come into play, political, economic, social, et cetera. Well, if we start to wrap our arms around this as a nation, certainly uh, I work for the federal government, so at a federal government piece, would that maybe change the way we use our power and influence overseas? For example, there's hard power and there's a common concept of, of soft power, but what if, usually it's conceived of military and diplomatic, what if there were things that were very useful for people in, say, Lagos, Nigeria, or some other major city, such as how do you do better firefighting techniques, um, so non-lethal weapon systems? There's an area that's in there that we might develop some expertise in. How do you quickly restore water systems? All that, that sort of thing, engineering. Why isn't that worked up into our diplomatic efforts, nation-to-nation -nation stuff, where a US country team has the ability to offer this menu of options that are not either um, what's sometimes called the death merchant side, which is what selling weapon systems and the training to go with it, or diplomacy normally conceived. Why, isn't, why aren't we able to operate that in the middle where people really care about these other issues? Because they deal with human security, human safety, I think they'd be very interested in it, and I think we would do very well with it. OK, my, my final comments in the interest of time are uh, taking a step back. If these dense urban areas, megacities indeed, are growing, well, 
where's the political power going? I can tell you as an observer, a close observer of the international uh, environment, although it's true international state wars are going down, there's a pretty good case to be made that the Westphalian nation state system is breaking down in areas where it didn't grow organically. Okay, there, I'm not saying it's over, thank heavens it's not, but there's a serious breakdown there. There are centrifugal and centripetal forces that are at play. So is it not possible that we may be seeing out to 2050, which is a the theme of this conference, the rise of city states? Now, I'm not gonna go through a whole theory on that, but, but is it not possible that Lagos, Nigeria, probably is, but certainly will be more important than Abuja, the national capital. Who has the real power? What's really going on here? We're already seeing cities like New York City, my hometown, has something of a foreign policy. And I, frankly, I think it should, but isn't that the province of a federal government? Whose is gonna be more effective, more useful, more, more um, effective? I, I don't know. But my, my point is that if we're going in that direction, then our concept of security likewise has to take into account all of those factors uh, and many more that I haven't uh, mentioned. You know, at the end of the day with cities, I, I work in Washington, D.C., but I actually live here in Brooklyn. Um, Washington, D.C., federal governments, national level issues, taking in tax money, uh, working through legislation, very important job. But in cities, you have to fill the potholes. You have to take care of picking up the garbage. You have to make sure the water is really running. There's, it's a much more practical application that I would say is highly valuable. And I think we have a, uh, a, a, the ability, as, a, as a, certainly the United States as a country, to really change the way that we, we look at these problem sets and to harness them. We cannot, meaning the military, certainly cannot do it alone. I'm just seeing where even in my space, of, of security issues, we have to take a much broader effort and uh, certainly look forward to having uh, increased cooperation among uh, the community of interest that we've already established and those of you who want to be part of it, I, I hope you'll join us. Well, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Well, thank you, Pat, um, for that presentation and for sharing that video. I think it was very thought-provoking. I'm going to talk a little bit differently about the set of issues that have to do with security. So the message is clear from the series of presentations that we've seen at the conference that urban areas are places to contend with as their numbers grow. This is 2050 that shows urban populations that are greater than 100,000. The circles are scaled in proportion to urban population, population size, and the colors indicate the percent of urban populations. There's increasing numbers of cities of all sizes as indicated by this map of cities in 2030. While megacities have unique challenges, I would like to focus on secondary cities as situated within the larger global and urban systems. There's also exists this urban, urban hierarchy where we have small to mega cities, where smaller cities make up a larger percentage of the urban population, what I would call the spaces in between. And we also need to consider this within the transition from the rural to urban spectrum, where you have the transition of rural to urban areas, whether they're the physical trans transition from rural to urban, both at the local scale and the regional scale, the relationship of rural and urban regions uh, in terms of their dependence upon food systems, the push-pull factors that exist between rural and urban sectors where you have seasonal migration and kinship networks, where there's an increasing divide between the rich and poor, between the rural-urban and between those in, within urban areas. So I'd like to, us to consider this within, within a nexus framework consider security within this context where each kind of security, food, water, energy, is situated within a broader landscape of institution, policies, cultures, and economies. I've rather disingenuously placed secondary cities in the midst of this diagram where human security is directly linked to food, water, and energy that define urban health. These urban needs, human needs linked to poverty, will sharpen the water, energy, food nexus in urban areas, and we'll need to address the fundamentally, fundamental security issues to understand the urban metabolism. 
We also need to consider the human footprint, I mean the urban footprint. While the urban footprint can be mapped as the spatial extent of the city, these are examples of looking at the total built up area in particular cities. They're not the municipal boundaries. We know that urban areas extend beyond the actual uh, municipal boundaries. We have to really consider the impact of the urban footprint that extends much further due to dependencies on other urban areas, dependencies on the local or regional hinterland, dependencies on global markets, regional and global linkages to other places, which create an urban ecology. And so there are external dependencies where we think about things like water sources, whether we have headwater, river systems, groundwater, agriculture, trade, energy sources, and then the internal structures of the city where we're talking about the internal uh, cityscape, parks, urban gardens as we talked about yesterday, waterways, natural, stormwater, sewerage, streetscapes, slums, waste management, infrastructure, where we track the growth and development patterns or measure uh, such things as urban heat islands. So I want us to think about something for just a moment. And this is an example from Colorado, where I live. Isn't this beautiful? Think so? Okay. So do you think this is a natural landscape? Everybody hear that? Okay. Well, I'm gonna tell you that no, it's not a natural landscape. This landscape has been redesigned and modified due to a number of historical trajectories that intersect. Miners for coal and precious metal, ranchers and farmers who introduce new crops and land use patterns, trans mountain water diversions. Each of these sectors, food, energy, and water, created its own policies, rules, and landscape change that enabled the development of the urban corridor that stretches from Wyoming to Pueblo, Wyoming, Laramie, Wyoming to Pueblo, Colorado. So this is a legacy landscape. I think that the historical context of, the develop, of urban development shouldn't be overlooked as we examine cities to better understand the constraints that are often imposed by the past. Cities are situated where they are for particular reasons linked to the surrounding environments, proximity to water, fertile soils, accessible to resources. These air, these, and we tend to forget these connections due to the city's ability to gather resources to it. So this historical uh, context defines the urban habitat, one that is largely built upon fragmented landscapes. Yesterday we were presented with the idea of biomimicry. Did I say that right? by Dixon, and increasingly we are managing fragmented landscapes where we need to determine how best to maximize ecosystem services that are essential for urban health, services that provide clean air, clean water, robust food systems, and we need science that understands how to create and mimic nature services on these altered landscapes. This is such an opportunity for science, and it's such an opportunity for geography. Aren't you all excited? I mean, this is a big deal. So I want us to then think about this in a couple of different examples. This is Cusco, Peru. So this is a location that's experiencing climate change, extreme events, natural disasters, but it's also experiencing migration change, population growth. And what we've seen over time is that this population growth, people are coming to Cusco for a number of different reasons, whether they're migrating there or moving there, but also Cusco has a rich history. It was the capital of the Incan Empire, the legacy landscape that provides the context for today's tourism industry. So we need to think about cultural sites and how we can protect those and how we need to map those. We also need to understand the new informal developments that are creating there, the risk zones where many poor people live and are exposed to landslides. Uh, and Cusco exists within the, settings of, within the setting of five different administrative units that span this particular, um, that span the, the actual physical conf configuration of the city itself that makes it challenging for mapping. Another example that we can look at is uh, Kharkiv, Ukraine. 
So Kharkiv is the center of, the, of Ukrainian culture. It's a major industrial transportation hub as well as a scientific research and educational center. While Kharkiv remains an important crossroads for uh, movement migration today, it also, uh, it also experiences the toxic legacy from the industrialization that occurred earlier. So we need maps that identify these locations, that overlie um, vulnerable populations with those regions, and are able to map health patterns and do conduct epidemiological studies. So we need data for um, baseline data, we need to understand the historical context and the need for culture, cultural data, human geography information. So part of this we can consider as we see cities are on the global stage. The role of governance, uh, the role that mayors increasingly play as leaders, um, such projects as sister cities, twinning projects, where people in cities learn from other people about how to build cities, how to adapt, and understand the redesigned nature of the cities that fit human needs, as well as providing examples of sustainability for policy making. So I think we need to consider a sustainability spectrum that takes on different flavors depending upon the geography, whether we're talking about the global north or the global south. Sustainability approaches and measures are different in Addis Ababa than in New York City. Scales of projection of projects need to, need to fit the location and priorities to meet local, regional, human security needs within the unique landscapes in which they are located, built upon local knowledge. Thank you. Okay, I think we've got a few minutes for questions. Yeah. Are you pointing at me? Please. <laughs> Just one minute. Yeah, here it comes. So I am a tree, I'm a big fan of Roman geography. I love a picture of it. So uh, next uh, 40 years in New York, if the population will increase to 12 people in 2015, now upper mid uh, price will increase faster uh, by percent cost of living, much more expensive, really high density changing in public transportation, what will happen? Uh, to have uh, better public transportation, to, to increase population? Yeah, so I, I think that's a good question. I'd like to kind of take that and wrap that with, you know, what are some of the challenges that are in general that are work that are all around dense populations in the future in urbanization? Uh, if you could answer his question and, and kind of take it a little bit open-ended. What are the what are the problems we're going to? Yeah, I mean, I mean what, what are the you know what do you th how do you think we can handle these complex problems? He's talking about transportation, right, um, and dense populations. You know, how are we going to handle some of these challenges, and what are some of those challenges? Right, I'll throw a few things out there. Uh, first of all, I don't know how we're going to handle them. Uh, what we do know is we have to start understanding the dynamics that are at play. We do know that we want to have dense urban areas have improved flow, including of people, and transportation obviously is a way that you flow people uh, in and around. How that works with uh, food, sewer, water, everything. It, so to me, a lot of what I think you're getting, get, getting at with your question, and certainly some of the things that we've been looking at, comes down to how do you best maintain a healthy, effective flow of a city, which already has it, and how do you minimize disruptions in the flow? How do you make the flow less toxic in the broadest sense of the term? It could be something that produces corruption. It could be something that's toxic to a human being. Um, so from my optic, from my point of view, we start with a very, we're trying to start with a very, very broad view. Then as you start looking down further into that, I'll, I'll pick up on your transportation theme for security and then uh, I'll leave it alone. But uh, the east side access tunnel uh, between Queens and Manhattan. It's very deep. It's going to handle, I believe, the, the predictions are 700,000 people a day uh, coming into Manhattan. 
What are the dangers if that gets disrupted? What, is it a lucrative terrorist target? Is it a lucrative target for epide epidemiological purposes? What if a disease gets in there? there? There are many things that we have to look at to include what happens in those systems of transportation. Uh, again, I don't have the answers. I do know from a security point of view, we have started looking at that with the primary intent being don't mess up the flow. Try to make it better, uh, and then you try to do the best you can with it. Okay. I think just to follow up on that, um, some things to think about is how I think resilient and adaptive human beings are. Um, we have an opportunity now to be living in different ways than we ever have before, and so I think we can come up with new ways to do that, and I think there are many different examples given yesterday in some of the talks about how to design cities in different ways, how to think about this. But I think we need to think about that within the context of what those trade-offs happen to be. Um, as we start to create different landscapes within an urban area, who are the winners and losers in any given location, and how do we ensure that there's an equitable redesign of the urban landscape that addresses all the different players across that um, rural, um, well, rich, poor divide that exists in many urban areas? Well, that's, uh, those are great comments. I mean, do, in general, do you, um, do you think, whether it's industry, government, academia, I mean, do, you, do, you, do either of you see communities of interest coming together um, for, you know, forming uh, and norming for the future uh, around urbanization and planning? Yeah, I, I certainly do. Uh, in fact, the example I used, how I know about the East Side Access Tunnel, because uh, we, we've been with the fire department and uh, mass transit folks and, and gone and taken a look at this because it's a unique piece. So as, again, it's my comments of security and safety, as people look at what is being built to include very, very tall buildings that are on very small footprints, that the actual base, they're called pencil skyscrapers, I believe, or pencil buildings, what does that mean for security, for safety writ large? How do you get firefighters up? How do you evacuate people out? Just for example. And as the people who are building these things, looking at them, promoting them, or are in a position to have to respond in an emergency capacity or to fix an elevator, quite frankly, uh, what are they seeing? What is it that we can share more broadly? Because we all look at problem sets from different angles. We all have our specializations. And so the more people you've got, in particularly a community of practice, meaning lots of people may be interested, but how many people can really contribute to a more practical, practicable uh, knowledge? How, how do you do that? So yeah, I see it happening. But th to be honest with you, it's only recently, uh, particularly with dense urban areas, it's only starting from what I've seen in an effective way, last three years, four years. Hmm. I think there's a number of participatory activities that are going on that have been in place for um, a while now. If you look at Eco City Builders or you look at City Alliances, there's a number of different non-governmental organizations that are coming together to address these very important issues and to create partnerships with government, to create partners with the other uh, levels of government in different uh, nations, as well as creating networks across the globe. So I think there's some really exciting um, progress that's being made on these fronts. With all your experience uh, in the international space, I mean, do you see, are there some areas around the world that are, are doing some of this planning and better than others? in terms of you know, preparing for, these, for the future with all you know, mapping and you know, you, in your field, right? Probably. You, do you, there's probably, okay. Yeah. Good, good. All right, I wanna go to, I think uh, I saw a couple hands in the back but, uh, there that, uh, do we have, uh, okay, we have a few. Let's... Throughout yesterday, people were talking about open data on, and how data should be accessible to entire crowds. But in the case of security data and defense data, for obvious reasons, it is confidential, although some people just don't get it, that it should be confidential. And this is compounded by the fact that it, several militaries are also very corrupt. So how, do, how does the security establishment maintain the fine balance between telling their people that they are transparent at the same time keeping sensitive data private? That's a great question. Um, so I won't go into issues of cybersecurity, cyber, security, cyber uh, defense of networks, that sort of thing, where data can be spilled, leaked, stolen, that sort of thing. But I had a really fascinating discussion with an organization here in Manhattan called Beta New York City. 
uh, which basically takes a look at how you can use the big data streams that are out there, I mean, that are out there open source, and, and improve people's lives with them. And that is highly valuable to everybody, including us. Well, the US government and the military, for example, produces a tremendous amount of data. And some of it is classified because it has to do with operational strategic uh, means. We have to protect sources, all that sort of thing, um, which, which I certainly do support. But I will say this. I think that there is a great deal of data, certainly from the, uh, from the federal government security forces, right, that can, in fact, be shared. I think that there's a tremendous amount of uh, health services data that can be very useful to people uh, in the civilian sector, open source. You just sh strip out the, the, the actual names and social security numbers, and you'd have a, a great sense of how the population, how given populations, say the military, for example, have reacted over years. Are they taller, more healthy, what have you? What's the rate of heart disease? There's, there's many applications for the massive troves of data that we've got that really, in my personal opinion, don't necessarily have to be classified. And I think we're at the point, just like uh, Google Earth, they drive these cars around and they strip people's faces out. You may see a human being, you don't see their face. You may see a car, you don't see a license plate. There's ways we can shield the appropriate data out there to include geographic data uh, and, uh, of, of all sorts that I think would, we're getting to a point where it's going to be useful. If I could just briefly um, support the comments that Melinda made on NGOs. NGOs are doing a tremendous amount of work there, and there's new forms of NGOs that are popping up all the time. And they themselves often facilitate these community of interest, communities of practice, for example. Uh, and they're a great place to go where military people, if there's trusted elements within the NGO, they can speak to get a sense of what it is that you need and what we might be able to open up. And then ultimately over time, perhaps develop policies that are more in line with the world that we're, we're moving into. So, so do either of you see, you know, whether it's diplomacy, whether it's use of NGOs, state to state, do, do you see changes in, in that apparatus around diplomacy um, that over time that will, you know, affect uh, urbanization of cities in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think that was demonstrated yesterday through some of the presentations where you're looking at things like OpenStreetMap and looking at ways that people can um, do participatory mapping, all of these things that are exposing people to a lot of these broad ideas and realizing, you know, the difference they can make through uh, having their voices heard and creating maps of their own communities that leads to a level of empowerment that I think that um, maybe communities have not experienced before. And so what they do with that and how they can uh, create change and difference um, with respect to representation with their own needs, that, that's something that's happening. And that's very exciting. We're, we're all part of that, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. exactly. Open street maps is, uh, is a pretty exciting time for everybody in GEO. These, you know, it's exciting. And the data, the data world is amazing right now for anybody who's in data analytics or, or just novices as well. So hey, look, I think we have time for one more question. I saw two or three hands in the back, but we can do one more. I'll let, uh, okay, right there. <laughs> um, so as a strategy going forward, do you think cities are inherently more stable or more vulnerable? Hmm. It's a very general question, but I think. Uh, you've already touched on it a little bit. I love it. I love that question because it speaks to the yin-yang balance of strategy and statements such as where there's chaos, there's opportunity immediately come to mind. Uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating. If you really look at, take New York, um, not New York now, New York when I grew up in the late 60s, 70s, 80s, right? Uh, it seemed chaotic, not to those of us New Yorkers, it didn't, it seemed perfectly logical. People from the outside would see chaos, we saw this is how we live. Concepts such as ungoverned or un undergoverned or ungoverned space, um, what we find when we look more closely, no matter where it is, urban or rural, somebody usually governs the space to some degree. It just not may, may, might not be a legally constituted government that we would recognize, that sort of thing. So. What I hope to get out of some of the work that I'm seeing come together, certainly in, in my area of security slash safety, is a recognition that what looks like chaos, it actually functions. If it didn't function, people wouldn't live there. The very act of being what it is, although there are slums and, and, and extreme wealth right next to it, uh, there's something that works there. Can it be better? Absolutely. We're not saying it isn't. Are there aspects or play parts of a city that are going to be more chaotic? Absolutely. There's a fascinating point came out from the, uh, the Atlantic Council. Um, had pointed out that slum dwell, that 
Slum dwellers will know every inch of their neighborhood, basically it's their neighborhood, whereas state and national governments don't even bother to map them. They change so that, well, those people know it, so there's a certain logic to it. So there's no good simple answer, but I, I like to take things and flip it on its head. So Waze, for example, you may have a chaotic city and the, the application Waze can help you navigate it. Why? Because people are self-reporting where the traffic blocks are. Well, you may see what looks like chaos. Are there ways, especially with enhanced communication and data flows and the rest, to create some order out of it and, and take advantage of that? So that, that's where I see going on. And there is a strategic argument to be made for this, and, but the debate isn't really going on yet. But it's, I think it's being teed up. I like think that humans are inherently self-organizing and self-governing um, entities. And so something to think about, um, you know, they, we, we find a way. We find a way to do things. And so um, a long time ago, I used to work on the U.S.-Mexico border. And we were looking at how to map the water system um, between Nogales, Sonora, and Nogales, Arizona. And we found out that there were connections between the U.S. water system and the Mexican water system on the border. And that really wasn't allowed. Um, but that's one way they, they solved the problem of not having adequate water for the city of Nogales. What also would happen on Saturday nights is people would go out and they would have parties and they would connect to the water system and their colonias and the informal sex sectors of the city to figure out ways to, again, get water to their colonias that were the informal uh, settlement places around the uh, city itself. So people find a way, and they figure out ways to make things work. And we've seen that all over the world. And again, I would come back to the issue of resiliency and adaptability of the human spirit. And I think that's a very positive thing for us to be focusing on and thinking about what we can do. Yeah, excellent. That's a great way to end on a positive note. Uh, I want to I thank you, Dr. Latore and Colonel Mahaney, for being here today and providing insightful comments. And, uh, we're ready to move to the next uh, session here. Thank you.